Question number five. So how do we uh, reconcile or understand the role of people who are, quote, non-Jewish in this framework? In other words, what's the relation between a person who's Jewish and non-Jewish? And we're talking about Jewish people, but also you know, as being fragments of Hashem, but like how do non-Jews sort of fit into that framework? Is there any way to understand the, the connection between those two different, seemingly different groups of people? Okay, so that's a great question. Um, unfortunately, also, we're looking at these uh, giant questions with, or seemingly small question with giant answers. Um, the concept of Jewishness, as it is currently culturally sort of like being discussed and described, unfortunately, is kind of part of the historical framework circumstances that we are in. Um, we are actually not Jewish. Um, the concept of being Jewish means that you are from the Shevet of Yehuda, and we are called Yehudim in Megillah Sester. That's one of the first places where that term shows up. And that's something which is obviously great. We can all know that we're from Shevet Yehuda. It's a great thing. But we are actually all descendants of someone named Yisrael. Which I know you guys all know that. I'm saying it in a specifically kind of wacky way because I'm trying to shake up some of the perspectives people have a little bit. Because um, there's a whole backstory to that in the Chumash as to who we are, like what, like what this family is about. We're part of a family. And this family had a particular thing that it was doing. And that particular thing was like super important. And we have a very hard time even seeing that. I'll just give you one of the, of the obstacles to realizing what it is that your family is doing. Uh, you live in America. A lot of people who are in this uh, chat, you know, Sheer are, are in America right now. Um, America is like designed pretty much, I would say 90%, maybe even 95%, um, patterned after the way that our family sets, sets things up. In other words, like a country that is built on the idea that people's lives are endless, irreplaceable. Like fundamentally, that's that's by far the most central and, and you know, um, significant perspective shift that our family was responsible for. I don't just mean responsible for like we made it happen. I mean, it was our responsibility to make sure that it was like that. That's like what our job is. And then you have like a country, America, that built itself on that and a number of other principles that are all interwoven with that, that are all simply Torah map principles. So now you have a funny thing, because now you, you are part of a family that's been saying all those things, but everyone around you in this country also thinks that. Like, everyone in this country thinks it's, it's an obvious idea that, that human life is unique and special and irreplaceable. It's, like, built into everything in the country. I mean, that's how, like, the, all the property rights are literally written around that. So, like, the, eco the economics of the country, the interrelations of the country, like, the, the idea of financial rights, like, the whole country works that way. So when once that's going on, it creates a situation where like now it's very hard to sort of see you because everyone is kind of like the same as that. And you don't even remember anymore sort of like that. that it wasn't always like that. It's a circumstance of history. So as an example, um, if anyone here has ever heard, there's a, there's a set of books called The Game of Thrones. I know it's also became a popular show. I never saw the show, but I read a bunch of the books. It was something which someone gave to me, and I, I, like, I happen to like reading um, different kinds of epic books. It's something which makes me, uh, I enjoy the interesting perspectives of the stories. This set of books, very, very, uh, I would say, I don't know if anyone here has read it, but like, I would say it's a little bit bizarre. Uh, it's bizarre because it's basically a world where there is no Torah. That's what the book is. Like, I think it was by accident. I don't think, I don't think the author was thinking like, let's write a book like that. But like in the books, there's, again, like the books aren't finished. So he's claiming, the author claims that like there will eventually be a purpose to the story. But basically the way the books work is everyone's constantly getting killed randomly and like it's literally the most haphazard. There's no there's no value of life. There's no value of, of relationships. It's like completely just wanton, like just depraved in so many ways. And it's just you sense the emptiness in the space. And like that's exactly what we were fighting against, like throughout history. That is what our family was about. Our family was trying to spread and and win wars against people who thought that if, you know, a child is, uh, whatever, uh, born in a handicapped way, then we just throw it off a cliff. Like, our, we fought every one of those things throughout history again and again and again and again. That is who we are as, as a family. And so now we live in a time period where we're getting ready for Olam Haba. So the world is starting to build towards people are actually making themselves receptive to what we are really about. And soon there's going to be a person who's going to be the leader of that, and he's going to be what we call Mashiach, and that's going to be the next phase. But like, that's just, you know, it's just circumstantial. So when you learn the Torah, you understand sort of like the, the background of who you are, then you'll sort of understand what it means to be part of B'nai Israel, And then the story becomes very different because we're not like, people think we're, we're the chosen people. And that just means that we're just special and chosen. Don't know what that means, but we're like, that's not any, anything even remotely close to what it is. Like we're not the chosen people in that sense. Like we are, to, to, to be chosen always implies 
there's a larger context. You can't just be chosen in a vacuum. Like, you have to be chosen for something. So there has to be something about the context of the story there that's missing. And if you read the Chumash, it's in there. I mean, it literally writes it. But again, when we teach the Chumash in a very fragmented way, lots of sukkim sentences of our Torahs and reading a lot of Rashi and, and not really trying to understand the stories and then understanding what Rashi is adding to the story. So, of course, you lose sight of the thread of your family. So that's, that's how it starts to answer that. And, and I think that, you know, to understand what it means to really be, be part of B'nai Israel is a very important thing because, like, that journey is not over. And, like, it's not like a... And it's not a small thing at all. Now, it happens to be that certain, during certain time periods, you might feel less impelled to, to walk the journey. But I would just, just to sort of go back to what Izzy was asking before, it's actually the most important to invest in the story of your family when it is the least seemingly relevant. Because that's the time that it's like, now you have freedom to actually do that. When the crisis comes and now suddenly the world is not on, the te- on, on our family's team, and now they think that it is okay to you know, throw people into gas chambers or whatever. So that's not the time to start investing in your perspective. Like That's the time to like run, or who knows what. You know, there's a lot of things to talk about with, what, what that was the time for. But like the, the idea was to sort of know who you are no matter what. There are many, many people during that time who actually still remembered who we were, and they went singing to the gas chambers. And it was obviously, again, to go back to our death conversation, super crazy what happened then but we're looking at a lot of people who went through that and we're like i remember who i am i remember what our family is about and i'm going to fight this like hand over fist the entire way and i'm going to never ever ever forget who i am throughout this this crazy situation where the entire world went the way of game of thrones and also the way of a malik which is the same thing and i'm going to fight the emptiness no matter what and even if i can't choose anything about my life all i can choose is how i'm going to die i'm going to go to die singing and I'm going to not forget like who I am and what it means to be someone. So that's essentially what, you know, that's, that's one way to start describing what our family is. On a practical level, it's hard to really convey how to do this better just because a lot of it is learning oriented. You have to really, you have to read the Chumash and you have to read the Chumash like, you know, for real, which is hard to do because the trickiest thing about reading the Chumash for us now is because there's so many circumstantial ideas that kind of came from wherever we got them, you know, things that are more popular, famous ideas that we've heard in the Chumash, like, you know, uh, like we all, if you've read the Chumash, you've heard of Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, and so I, just as a random one, Avram has something to do with Midas HaChesed, it's a kind of a popular idea, like, what is Chesed? You know, Chesed seems to be something to do with a brother and sister being physically intimate in Parshas Achremos. so what does that mean? You know, like, these are like basic questions to ask when you're reading the Chumash that like, we're not asking them because we already know. Chesed means loving kindness. So it's super easy to answer that, really. I feel like that doesn't solve the problem so well. Um, and that's that's true for the, all the stories. I mean, like sentence by sentence, I, I, like there's just so many things that, you know, are like if you read the Chumash just trying to follow what every sentence is adding, there are so many sentences you're like, why is the sentence even here? If you took it out, it wouldn't even matter. And there's paragraphs like that. I can show you a crazy paragraph in Parshas uh, Vayishlach. No reason for it. Like it's like 20, it's like 10, 12 sentences. That's just, it doesn't seem to have any place in the story. It doesn't seem to be necessary. If you took it out, you wouldn't miss it. It's the paragraph where at the end it says that um, that Devorah dies, uh, Menekes Rivka. It's like a random paragraph, Parshas Vayishlach. You can look it up there. It's, it's the end of the paragraph. Um, it's like, and I have a whole like approach as to what it's about. I, mean, I did an analysis to try to explain the theme of the paragraph to figure out why it's there. But like, I was like reading that. I'm like, why is this paragraph here? If you deleted it from the Chumash, it would not make a difference at all. And from the story that's there, it would not make a difference. And there's a million of those things. Like, what is Migdal Bavil? You notice that Avram only starts after Migdal Bavil. Before that, there were like a series of other people in a row. Each one was sort of leading up to things, and then they all failed. And then Avram was like the next phase. And, you know, just to sort of say it like this, the whole Chumash is actually a response to the story of the Garden of Eden. It's like the Eitz Adas Tovarah. A bunch of people over time tried to fix it. They all failed. And then the rest of the Chumash from Parshas Lechacha until the end is setting up a system, which is our family, that's designed to undo what happened in the Yitzhak story. Like, just as like a beginning, you know, like there's just so much to talk about there in the Chumash itself, but that's basically how I would start to answer that, if that kind of did something a little bit, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> All right. Okay, anything else? Any other questions? I could stay here as long as people want, obviously. We don't have to like uh, stop or continue. Nobody has to feel pressure to stay. Yeah, what's up, Yona? Let's see if I can unmute you. Yeah, how are you? <laughs> 